May God bless you and keep you on this uh, first Sunday, uh, Communion Sunday of October, October 2nd, 2022. Uh, we thank God for allowing him to bring us once again together uh, to praise his holy name. We know that he has been so good to us despite the darkness that is going on in the world today, uh, despite the things that, that, that many see as darkness but may be good, right? Uh, we do know that God is in control of all things. Uh, that means the weather. So when we think about Hurricane Ian and Fiona and all these hurricanes that have, that have plagued us in the past 30 days or more, right? From Puerto Rico to Cuba, right? To Florida, to the Carolinas. We do know that God is still working, that he is on the throne and he is uh, seeking us. He was seeking a voice from us. And uh, I, I knew though that, knew, do know that many missionaries, when you see on the television screen, are, are there helping those who are who are in need, who are who have lost everything, uh, but but in essence, have they lost everything? Right. God has lifted them up out of darkness. He has preserved their life. Yes, they have lost all the material things of their life, but they still have themselves. They still have their family, their spouse, their their pets, or whatever they value the most. Right. So God is still working. He will replace those things that have been lost. So when we think about uh, Job, the story of Job, how he lost everything, can you imagine how devastating that would be to lose all of your children, to lose everything that you've owned, right? And then also be afflicted with an illness that you thought that would take you out, that would kill you. But God, because of his mercy and because he wants your attention at all times, preserved Job and gave him back double what he had lost before. And that is because of God's great grace and mercy and what he is intending to do for us because he loves us so very, very much. So we definitely want to lift up in prayer, right? Uh, those who have lost everything, thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people whose lives have been transformed by this storm. And this season is not over. I mean, this, uh, this hurricane season will not end until sometime in November. So we do know that God is going to uh, continue to uh, do things that, that may not be in our favor, but because God is a mysterious God and we cannot understand or figure out why he is doing what he is doing, we do know that we still need to praise him as Job did, right? That I will put my hand over my mouth and I will speak no more because you are the God. You are the God, right? That everything you do is for a specific purpose during a specific moment in time. And yes, it hurts to see these things. It hurts. And you wonder, how can we rebuild? Yes, and they will rebuild. And things may not be or look the way that they used to. But when we go back and look in uh, South Florida or Southwest Florida in the future, that it will be transformed. And it may take many, many months and years. But God will make a way out of no way because that's who he is. Amen. So I just want to uh, uh, just talk a little bit about it as we look at the the wars and the rumors of wars and those things that are going on in the world today and how they continue to change the landscape or change the way of thinking that many of us uh, feel today, that, that things are uncomfortable, right? Uh, you cannot, uh, just as an example, you cannot go into one nation and do a land grab, right? And say, this is mine. And then because you've been in a headlock for all 12 rounds or you've been losing the fight with Mike Tyson for all 12 rounds, decide because I won round 12 that I am the victor of this particular battle. It doesn't, no, it doesn't work that way, right? You, it's not a land grab. And these things are immoral and they are wrong. When you think about the hundreds of thousands of people who are now displaced in countries like Ukraine, right? Who have been displaced because... They didn't even ask for it, and they're not even trying to go into a competing country that is trying to destroy them. They just want to be at peace. So let us lift up all those in Ukraine and those who are in Russia who are fleeing Russia, right? Funny how God works, right? Several months ago, we see the Ukrainian people in, in the middle of winter walking across the different borders, right, for safety as their cities and their communities were being bombed. And yet now when you turn on television, you see the Russian citizens by the hundreds of thousands leaving their own country because of a brutal dictatorship that doesn't make any sense and will, and will amount to absolutely nothing in the end. What does it profit a man for him to gain the whole world and yet loses his own soul? That's what this is all about. How much power can you have on this earth? There's no, much, there's no more power that you can have on this earth than to be the president or the governor of a, of, of a particular uh, country, right? 
that's about as far as it goes, right? If you're the president of the United States, that's about as far as it goes. You can't get any more powerful than that, right? So you can't go around competing and taking what doesn't belong to you and claim that it's yours and have a good conscience about it and have the support of millions of people and think they're going to support you over foolishness. So that's what we're going to talk about a little bit about today, about idolatry, right? That in the minds of other people, that land is an idol. I have to have it. Or because of uh, a historical perspective, because it belonged to our country many, many years ago, I have to have it. Can you imagine Mexico decided to say, you know what, or France decided to say, you know what, we want our land back. We want Texas all the way up to the state of Oregon. We want all that back. Can you imagine that, right? So that is what is happening today, that you go back and try to reclaim something that's not yours. That is an idol, right? And you have no business trying to worship an idol for your own self-indulgence, right? Or for your own pleasure, because it leads to absolutely nothing but, but chaos and death and destruction. The night is far spent, the day is at hand, so let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light, and what I want to talk about today as we go into prayer first, dear Lord, thank you for allowing us to wake up and see another today. Thank you for uh, my oldest brother who has uh, had another birthday on yesterday and my, my nephew who celebrated a birthday. Uh, I, I, I'm glad that they were able to wake up and see another day today with a smile on their face, right? And be able to proclaim and say, today is my birthday, knowing that this is the day of their birth and they, they are rejoicing and praising God for what he has done for them yet again today, that they are still here and God still has a purpose for their lives today. Whether you're 10 years old or 62 years old, it doesn't matter. God still has a purpose for you in this world. So we want to lift up all those people who are celebrating birthdays today or just in the month of September and October. God bless you and keep you. And I pray, Lord, that we, may be, that we may find something out of this message today, that it may uh, in, uh, uh, lift our spirits, lift our hopes in knowing that you are a loving God, a forgiving God. I ask this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So in light of that, what we want to talk about is this particular king, uh, we, we, we don't give it much thought, right? Uh, I know many people have probably heard this preached before. This is King Amon. King Amon, coming out of 2 Kings, the, the 21st chapter, verses 19 through 26. King Amon, right? King Amon. Very short, only eight verses long. But if I want to tag this as a title, and it took me a long time to tag this as a title, right? And this is how, this is how smart I am, right? Idolatry and King Amon. I couldn't give it any more than that. I mean, that's about as far as I can go. Idolatry and King Amon. That's as, about as far as I can go. I, I couldn't give it any more <laughs> justice than that, right? Because that's what it's all about in those short eight verses. And let's read it in its entirety. Talking about these kings of Judah, right? And I'll give some background uh, after I read this text. So to kind of help you understand what is going on at this time. But do know that in the book of Samuel, right, before Israel, all of Israel had a king, right, that it was Samuel. God spoke to Samuel, the prophet Samuel, and Samuel was going to uh, God, and they were going back and forth about why Israel needed a king. It was because all their neighbors had kings. They wanted to look like everybody else. But God said, I am the one that you should be worshiping. I am the one that you should be paying attention to at all times. And yet they did not listen to God, right? And Samuel went and told the people, right? those in the high places of, of Israel, and said, listen, God said, you know, they will make your, your daughters into confectionaries, and they will uh, turn your men into soldiers, and many will die at the sword. Is this really what you want? We should be serving God, the true and living God, right? But if you want a king, God is listening, and he will give you a king. But do not forget him. He is the one who brought you out of Egypt, right? put you on eagle's wings and brought you out of a land out of 435 years of bondage. Do not forget about him. Oh yeah, I'm going to give you a king, but don't forget about me. So here we go with this text. Amon, king of Judah, right? Don't miss this. Amon was 22 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem for two years. Get this. So he was 24 when his reign ended. And we're going to Read further into this. His mother's name was Meshulamesh, daughter of Haraz. Haraz, she was from Jotbah. 
Verse 20, he did evil, right? Talking about Amon, in the eyes of the Lord as his father Manasseh had done. He followed completely the ways of his father, worshiping the idols his father had worshiped and bowing down to them. He forsook the Lord, the God of his ancestors, and did not walk in obedience to him. Amon's officials conspired against him, assassinated the king in his palace, in his own house. And then the people, in verse 24, the people of the land killed all who had plotted against King Amon. So what that means is his own administration killed him in his house. And then the people killed the people who plotted against King Amon, right? They cleaned house, right? The people of the land killed all who had plotted against King Amon, and they made Josiah, his son, king in his place. And as for the other events of Amon's reign and what he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? Not in the book of Chronicles, but yeah, he is in the book of Chronicles. He was buried in his tomb in the garden of Uzzah, and Josiah, his son, succeeded him as king. Now, oftentimes when you read the book of Chronicles, it talks, it always ends with, uh, and, it's, and, and, was this, and is this not written in the book of the Chronicles? Is this, and he is buried uh, among the kings of David or something like that, right? Means that he was held in high favor, that he was a, a king of Judah and, they, and that they buried him near David, right? And, and, you know, as the mortuary, you know, as the cemetery continues to fill up, right? All the plots begin to fill up, all the sepulchers begin to fill up, right? So over time, you have a full cemetery, right? And you're running out of space, basically. But when you think about certain kings like this King Amon, right, and Manasseh, they buried them in their gardens. They were not buried in the cemetery along with King David and the other kings. Why? Because they were so evil and they were full of idolatry. Let's get into this. Point number one, King Hezekiah, the king, the good king, right? There were many kings before King Hezekiah. And just to give you an idea, Amon is the 15th king of Judah just to give you an idea. So point number one, King Hezekiah, the good king. Right? So King Hezekiah is the good king. King Hezekiah is one that calls upon the Lord upon the time of his reign. And King Hezekiah was 25 years of age. Bear with me for a moment. And he does what did what was right for the Lord. And he tore down the high places and the, the brazen altars of Moses that people were continually to steal, uh, uh, you know, worship these idols of Moses, right? The, the the golden staff, right? With the snake around it that uh, that kept them from being uh, killed or bitten by these uh, venomous snakes while they were in the desert. They were still worshiping that along with other idols. Think about that when you get a chance. The wilderness serpent. And he simply trusted in God. Hezekiah simply trusted in God. Now, one important thing we should know as I cut across the field is that 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 this King Hezekiah, who had been instrumental in constructing a water conduit under the city, right? He was an engineer. He was a smart king. He was an engineer. He realized out in the desert, right, or around Jerusalem, that you needed a good a water filtration system to have clean water, clean drinking water, and good sanitation and stuff like this because the city was growing, right? And it was a beautiful city. So he was instrumental in building this beautiful, beautiful conduit, which still exists today. So during the time of the king's reign, the events of King Hezekiah is written in 2 Kings chapters 18 to 20. Get that, three, three, three chapters. King Hezekiah had many flaws, but all in all, he was a good king. So, so good that, that in time, God gives him another 15 years of life because of his faith and obedience in him, right? So God blessed Hezekiah so much and that he was victorious in the battlefield during his reign. He, he defeated the Philistines and many other enemies of Judah, right? But he did something that he should not have done. When the Assyrians came upon Judah, right? Bear with me for a moment. He sends to the king of Assyria in Lachish gifts of gold and silver, right? He wants peace. King Hezekiah just wants peace, and he'll give away his right arm for peace. So he's too kind, right? He's too good and too kind, right? So here we go. He sends these gifts off to the king of Assyria, and, you know, the Assyrians want to destroy. They want a land grab as well. They want to destroy as much, uh, you know, throughout the region as they can, take as many countries and people as they can, right? So here we go. In the process of time, he shows and sends all of the gold and the silver and the brass throughout the house of God in Jerusalem to the king of Assyria. He shows off everything, all the beauty of King Solomon's, right? King Solomon's temple. 
Verse 16 of, of chapter 18, at this time did Hezekiah cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the pillars which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. He gave away everything, right? Just for peace. You know, these things mean nothing. You know, he was just overly kind, right? But he should not have done these things. Now, you can imagine that over the process of time that the king of Assyria wants everything that he has seen. You know, it's almost like going to a bookie, right? And you, you pay him off for those bets, right? And But he sees that you're driving a Porsche. <laughs> so he's like, wait a minute, you, you're you still driving a nice car. I want your car too. <coughs> <coughs> Even though that was not part of the bargain. That's what has happened. It's like, listen, I'm giving you all these gifts you didn't even ask for. But now the king of Assyria says, you know what? I just want all of Jerusalem. How about that? So the king of Assyria wants everything that he, has, that he has seen and decides to encamp around Jerusalem, take several years to do so, several months and years, to basically starve them out, right? right? All for the sake of securing and removing all the gold and silver from the house of God and throughout Jerusalem, okay? So at this time, just to give you some type of historical perspective on this, uh, Isaiah is still around at this time, the prophet Isaiah, and he is prophesying to King Hezekiah, telling him what and what not to do and what thus saith the Lord, what God is instructing him to do at this time. So over time, Hezekiah calls out to God in verses 16 to 19, saying, Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear, open your eyes, O Lord, and see and hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly the Lord uh, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire, but they were uh, not gods, but the works of men's hands, right? These things have no value whatsoever, right? They are made of wood and stone. Therefore, they destroyed them. Now, therefore, O Lord, our God, I pray, save us from his hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord God, you alone. So this is Hezekiah who is fully aware of what the Assyrians are, are trying to do to Israel. So God eventually delivers King Hezekiah and the children of, of, of Judah from the hands of the Assyrians. And because of King Hezekiah calling out to God and trusting in him, right? And this is why he buried uh, next to the sepulchers of David, right? God extends the life of Hezekiah by 15 years while he's on his deathbed. Scripture says that, that when Hezekiah is about ready to die, he's on his deathbed, right? That that uh, the prophet Isaiah comes and puts some figs under his thigh, right? And says, thus says the Lord, you know, you, because of your obedience, I'm just paraphrasing, right? Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to extend your life, right? Not only that, the Lord turns back the sand dial 10, 10 degrees for Hezekiah's sake, because God is merciful and because he has promised that Hezekiah would return back to the house of the Lord in three days, right? As he had promised through the prophet Isaiah, so Hezekiah did what was right in the sight of God, and then he died, and his son Manasseh reigns in his stead. Now here we get to the evil. And as I say, that King Amon was evil, but his father was eviler, right? They were both evil, right? I don't know which one was more evil. You have evil and you have Dr. Evil, right? I mean, so that's pretty much how you want to look at it. So point number two, King Manasseh, the evil king, right? So he is the son of Hezekiah. Can you imagine being born of the house, right? And you're seeing all the great things that your father has done. You see, you are seeing what God has, how God has blessed your father, extended his life, set the sundial back, meaning he set back, he, he slowed down earth, right? <laughs> Just to prove that he is God, right? Can you imagine these things? And he is aware of these things. Manasseh is aware of these things. Can you imagine this? So now we have the son Manasseh. His dad has died, right? Hezekiah has died. And we find that Manasseh did what was evil in the sight of God. How can that be? It says that he built up the high places and he built altars of Baal, right? And Manasseh was the most wicked and, and reigned the longest. Get this. He reigned the longest even in his, during, even because he was, so, he was so evil, right? But yet he still reigned the longest. He even sacrificed his own children, right, before the devil, he also did something that was despicable and unconscionable. He placed an altar in the house of God, the house that Solomon had built, right? Many of us talk about King Solomon's temple, right? Can you imagine? He went in and put an altar of Baal inside the house of God. It's almost going to your local church, wherever you're at today, or the churches that you used to attend. Can you imagine someone coming in and putting, it, 
putting up a big silver or, or a big wooden altar of, of a devil, right? Or a half man, half oxen type figure, and you're supposed to go in and worship that individual, that thing, right? And, if, and, and, and because you believe in this so much that you will also sacrifice your children on the altar, right? Or through the fire for Baal. That's what's going on with King Manasseh. He did what was evil in the sight of God, sacrifices his own children. So as Manasseh continued to serve Baal, God called upon him to change his ways, to return back to him. This is how merciful God is. Even the description I just gave you of how, how evil this man was, right? That God called upon him to change his ways, to return back to him, to put away the idols and, and the high places, the groves and the gardens, worshiping Baal. And Manasseh chose to take, up, take it up a notch, right? He refused to listen to God. He took it up a notch, right? More than even the enemies of God, the scripture says, the Amorites had done before him. He, even though, I mean, the Amorites didn't, they, they know nothing about the Torah. They know nothing about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right? These were evil, evil people. It says that Manasseh said, you know, I'm going to take it up a higher level than the Amorites. Right? So because the prophet Isaiah was prophesying at this time to Hezekiah that during the time of Manasseh's reign, get this, that Isaiah was sawed in half in a hollow log that he was hiding in during the reign of Manasseh. Right? That this man of God, Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, right? The book of Isaiah, which uh, uh, emulates or is pretty much a uh, cut-and-paste version of the entire Bible, right? That he was sawed in half during the reign of Manasseh. That's how evil these people were. So here's God's response to the children of Judah before we get into King Amon, just to paint a picture of what's going on in this text. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of God, God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah that whoever hears it, both his ears shall tingle. So God has had enough of Manasseh, King Manasseh, right? That when people hear about, you know, if you even speak about Jerusalem and Judah, that whoever hears it, that your ears, that both of your ears will tingle. That means that you will, you will pay attention to what's going on. You will not believe what you are hearing. And God says, I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab, and I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down, cleaning it up. Side down, right? I am going to clean house. I have had enough, right? Because you have despised and you've done what is wicked in the house of God and you have despised me and you have forgot about all of the mercy and grace that I have given to the house of Judah. And I will forsake the remnant of mine inheritance and deliver them into the hand of their enemies and they shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies. What that means is I'm going to allow every enemy that wants to destroy you to come in and destroy you and take you into captivity because I have had enough with you. And because they have done that which was evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came forth out of Egypt, even unto this day, you have forgotten what I have done. 435 years of slavery brought you out of Egypt, right, on dry land. Right? Kept you alive for 40 years by feeding you manna from heaven. Brought you over on dry land, the River Jordan. Had Joshua fight all these battles for you. Give you the promised land, a land filled with milk and honey. And yet you turn your back on me. Verse 16, moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much. He continued to sacrifice the children of Judah who were worshiping Baal. Very much, the scripture says. Till he had filled Jerusalem one end to another. Ooh. beside his sin, wherewith he made Judah to sin in doing that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He took it to another level. He sacrificed. He had the high places, right? People were bowing down uh, to these false idols of, of wood and, and concrete, right? And silver. Point number three, King Amon, pure evil. So here we go. The son of Manasseh. Now, I just read to you the evilness of, of Manasseh. Now we have the son, King Amon. So we find at the end of chapter 21, another king, the son of Manasseh, who reigns after his father, Manasseh. And the scriptures tell us that at the age of 22, King Amon, the 15th king of Judah, begins to reign in Judah, right? Oftentimes when, you know, oftentimes we, when, we, when you have conversations with friends and family and you're like, wow, how, how, how could she turn out that way? Or how could he turn out that way? What happened, right? 
And as you begin to look at the, the psychological aspects of it or the physical or the environmental aspects of the story of that particular person, you say that person is a product of their own environment, right? When you see children doing evil or even adults, or you see, you're like, wow, how could, why, why even the grandchildren are doing evil? Everyone is doing, you are a product of your generation and you're a product of your environment. So basically what you hear and what you see is how you're going to perform. But glory be to God, you had kings like Hezekiah, and you had kings like Jotham, you had kings like Josiah, you had kings like Abijah and Jehoshaphat, right? You had some great kings, very few, just a handful of great kings throughout Judah. Glory be to God, God always finds a way. He always has someone come in, right, and, and step in on your behalf, right? Because of your evilness, he finds someone to come in and, and provide comfort for, for the people who need comfort the most. So point number three, King Amon, pure evil, as I stated, at the age of 22. So what this means is, right, as we get further into this, and, and we'll find, you know, just in these short eight verses, that Josiah, one of the greatest kings of all Israel, begins to reign, reign at eight years old. Keep this in mind, right? That means that King Amon, as I'm getting ahead of myself, if he is reigning, right, at the age of 22, and he's dead by 24, assassinated by 24, and then his son Josiah, right, reigns at eight years old. That means that King Amon, uh, you know, had Josiah when he was around 15 or 16 years of age, just to give you an idea. So he was around 15 or 16 years of age when King Josiah was conceived. So here we go. So we find in these short eight verses is the story of a young king who was born in sin and continues in sin. He's a product of his environment, right? As believers and those committed to learning about the faith, what we should take from the events of King Amon is that he never heard the voice of God. Right? Manasseh never sat down and told him Bible stories, right? He, he didn't know about Egypt, right? I mean, he refused to listen. His ears did not tingle. He continued to do what was evil in, this, in, 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 this, in the sight of God. This is what my dad did, and this is what I'm going to do. Okay? And if he actually did listen to the voice of God, it was something that he never embraced and took serious. It was probably just a passing thought. If, someone even, if some believer around Judah even mentioned God, right, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and talk about Moses, it was probably something that's like, so what, right? So this particular king is walking in the same footsteps as his father, number one. He walked not in the ways of the Lord, number two, and he served the idols that his father served and that his father had built up as well, right? To make matters worse or better from the eyes of Judah, his own servants conspired and killed him at the age of 24 years old. Many of you have 24-year-old kids, right? You imagine their mindset and things like this. So he's reigning at 22, okay, and dead at 24. So then the people destroyed those who conspired against the king and slew them. That means you are a product of your... What that means is this man was so isolated and alone, and we see many dictators today or people trying to be dictators, or trying to uh, hold power over their people, right? That over time, right, even those in your administration see your foolishness, right, and the wickedness of your heart, and they come in and take you out, okay? But not only that, that the people rose up and said, even the conspirators, those who had king killed the king, King Amon, right? We're going to kill them too. We got to start afresh. I, we don't know... Uh, you know, where all this evilness started, but we're just going to destroy everything. We're just going to clean house. Remember what I said about God, that over time I will wipe Judah and Israel like a dish, that inside and out, that I will just clean it. And that is what's happening. This is kind of a remnant of what God was talking about, right? So here we go, the turning point of a nation, right? Verse 24, and the people of the land slew all them that had conspired against King Amon, and the people of the land made Josiah his son king instead. This means that Josiah, as I stated, uh, was conceived at, uh, under Manasseh, his father, at around age 16. That Manasseh was around age 15 or 16 years old. But here's the beauty of it. The people made Josiah the son, his son, the king, right, at eight years old. In 2 Kings 22 and 1, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for 31 years. Isn't it amazing that when you go back and look at the, all the kings of Israel and Judah, right, 
that the ones that were most obedient to God had the longest lifespan. The ones that were most disobedient and turned their backs to God lived the less, except uh, Manasseh, who lived the longest, as evil as he was, right? But, get this, because he repented to God, but his son Amon did not, could mean the reason why Amon only has eight short verses in here. God said, you know what, you... It, Whatever you're doing has no significance to the kingdom of heaven whatsoever. <laughs> so these two short years that you're going to reign, no significance. All I want you to do is have this kid by the name of Josiah, your son, right? And get this, what's amazing is because this man was so evil, Amon was so, it's amazing that Josiah wasn't sacrificed, right? That he didn't kill his only son. But because God preserves and protects those of his own, and he has a plan for all those, even in these difficult environments, if you're a product of it, that eventually one will have common sense and, and say, you know what, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to turn away from all these things that are wicked and evil. I'm, I'm hearing about of God who brought us out of Egypt, and I see that we are a divided kingdom, right? Israel and Judah, and what's going on doesn't make any sense that we are worshiping these things and destroying our own people for gods that don't speak back to us, right? So God is angry, right? So I guess the questions one must ask about King Amon was, he knew nothing about serving God, right? He was serving and reigning how he was taught in these short eight verses. His sin was so great that his own servants had him killed in his house. Think about that. And as I begin to close, right, as we meditate on these things, God is angry. Let's not forget the promises of God. Even today, even though this is Old Testament scripture, right, that this is the same God always today, yesterday, and forevermore. So don't think what, what King Amon has done, you know, that there is some resemblance of what we do to God as well. Right? That we put things on high places, right? Where there's houses and uh, million dollar cars. I've seen, you know, you know, someone lost a million dollar car, you know, and, and their Rolls Royce uh, in the floods, right? That, you know, that, 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 that these idols, right? That God will come and destroy these things if we don't come to him with a pure heart. We can have those things, but we have to come to God with a pure heart and put him first above all things. But we have to be careful about the idols, Right? that we worship day in and day out, even our own children, that we place them upon pedestals, that we put our children before God, right? That we put things, material things before God, right? Our jobs and our careers, all these things before God. And God will come and wipe you like a dish inside and out. He will come and cleanse you. He will come and purify you. And he will get your attention as he did with King Amon. He has him killed after two short years of reigning in Judah. So what this means is that God will, he will pursue his house, right? He will, he, will, he will purge his house from the inside out when he gets time. When he, when he finally gets fed up, right? 15, 15, you know, 15 kings later, right? I'm, I've had about enough, right? Up and down, right? Those who worship me and those who don't, right? I will come and clean and wipe it clean, right? And begin to polish it and make it a place worth worshiping again. I will come back into your heart and reign forevermore. I will come back in and love you forevermore if you turn to me. You can have all these things, but put me first above all these things, right? right? And my kingdom will, 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 will be waiting for you, all right? This man's sins were so severe, right? That you can imagine how God will polish and make clean our own hearts and our own souls, right? Right? That simply God doesn't give him time to repent. Get, the, get this, right? That I would, I would say this, right? In, in the scriptures, there was a time when he, you know, in the book of Revelation, it says that I gave Jezebel time to repent and she didn't. I guarantee you in these two short years that Amon was reigning, right? Because Amon can't come back to him on judgment day and say, I never knew. That in these two short years, that God deal, did try to speak to Amon in some sort of way, and he refused to listen to the voice of God. We are all given the opportunity to listen, right? And to have God as our Lord and personal Savior. 
the one who will comfort us and protect us and keep us. Because why do we find Josiah at the age of eight immediately falling in God's footsteps, right? So God did give him time to repent and he refused not to, right? So we should know that God truly loves us when we look at these passages of Scripture, when we look at King Amon, right? The son of Manasseh, who is just as evil. Even though you're a product of your environment or a product of your generation and you see things, pure evil around you in darkness at all times, that God will, right? It'll be tingling to your own ears, but he will be trying to talk to you and pull you out of this darkness and bring you into the marvelous light, right? So we should know that God truly loves us in despite of ourselves, and yet, and yet he is willing at any time to forgive us of our sins and turn our hearts, um, turn all hearts of men into one of light instead of darkness. God will forgive. And this is how I know God will forgive. And I gave her space to repent, as I said, talking about Jezebel, of her fornication, and she repented not. Manasseh repented, and God forgave him. Behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Scripture says that in 1 John, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So even though Manasseh and his son Amon were the two most wickedest kings ever, it is Manasseh who repents for his idolatry, where his son Amon did not. God wants us to repent today. Doesn't matter how rebellious we've been, how hateful we've been, how we've turned our backs against him and never talked to him, choosing to do whatever we want to do, like we're going to live forever, right? Like this life belongs to us. I have to live my own life. This life does not belong to you. God has given it to you as a precious gift, as you have seen in the past few days that many people who have walked away after uh, being isolated in darkness with no food or water have realized that uh, I am not in control of any of this. Man is not in control of any of this, and there's nothing you can do to stop it. God is waiting for a simple response from all of us, that we acknowledge who he is and that he is just and faithful to forgive us of our own sins, if we are to come to him with a forgiving heart. So come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your weary souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this lesson today of just a few of the king's of, his, of Judah. We know there's many, many stories out there and we will continue to understand and, and try to digest and unpack some of these uh, different kings to figure out where do we sit? Where do we fit in in these stories? Well, this is where we fit in that, that, that God is trying to tell us, right? It doesn't matter if you're a king or, or, or a vagabond. It doesn't mean if you sweep in the floors of the, of, of the temple. It doesn't matter. He is willing and, and, and waiting Right? to forgive us of all sins and bring us, and bring us back into his grace and mercy. So this man was disobedient. His father was disobedient. But God forgave Manasseh, even in all the evilness, for over 32, 33 years right, that he reigned over Judah, passing thousands of children and, and, and people into fires and having them sacrificed for Baal. But because he repented, God forgave him. So Lord, let us learn, Lord, that that in those short two years that Amon was reigning, that, that this could be our life, right? That we must pay attention at all times and, and, and be willing to drop to our hands and knees and bow down to a God who loves us, truly loves us, and wants to save us from all sin. Didn't have to be. Two short years as a king. And it ended in conflict and misery. But glory be to God, King Josiah, who paid attention and heard the voice of God. So, Lord, we will be careful to give you all the glory, honor, and praise. And it is in the Max's name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
because this is Good Communion Sunday, I'd like to uh, know that, that, that there's only one true king, amen. Right? He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And he is waiting and listening and he is paying attention to all things. Right? He wants to see how, our, how we have lived our lives while we are here on earth. Because he is the faithful judge. He is the right, righteous judge. And, but he will judge accordingly. He will separate uh, the goats from the sheep one day, right? Light from darkness. So let's be on the, the right side, right? Let's, let, let's, let's be on the right side, right? Of light and not darkness. That he will not find any fault in us. So this righteous king came one day, right? Dwelt among us, right? And he, he died on Calvary. Didn't know sin, right? He was God's only son. His name is Jesus Christ. And he died at Calvary, shed his blood for us, right? And God raised him from the dead on the third day. And so that's what we celebrate today, that this is the King of kings, Lord of Lord, that he reigns, that he is sitting on the right-hand side of the Father, the one who is keeping this earth moving like this, the one who's in charge of the, of the fires and the, the earthquakes and the earth and the hurricanes and the tornadoes and the wars and the rumors of wars and the unrighteousness and the darkness and the light. He's in charge of all of these things. But before he died, right, on the night that he was betrayed, says that when he was sitting around with his disciples that he, that he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, I want you to take and eat this bread, right? Which represents my broken body, right? Each time you eat this bread, you know, remember me. This is what I have done for you. That, that they have, uh, you know, that, that, that I am sacrificing myself, my broken body for you, right? It says in like manner that when he, he had supped, when he had took the cup, right, that he, that he, you know, he said, take and drink, right? This represents the New Testament. It, as often as you eat of this bread and drink of the cup, you do so for my uh, death and resurrection when I return again. But I will not have it again until you come into my kingdom. That's just something to shout about and be excited about, that one day we will all be able to have communion with him. He's already had it 2,000 years ago for the last time on earth with man, but he will have it again the second time with us when we go into his kingdom. That's something to be joyous about. But let us wake up on the right side of righteousness and light and not be like King Amon, right? Who was a product of his own faults, of his own generation, of his own environment and chose not to repent to God. So let us eat of the bread and drink of the cup. The bread represent, represents the broken body of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the Son of God. And let us drink of the cup, which represents the New Testament that we have between uh, God and man. Dear Lord, I want to thank you for allowing us, giving us an opportunity, for many didn't wake up today, and many have lost everything, but thank you for giving us the opportunity to remember who you are today, just by uh, the darkness and the misery and the conflicts going on in the world today, that things appear to be and seem to be getting perpetually worse. Lord, we will continue to hold on to your ever-changing hand, that you will continue to uh, guide us in the right direction, guide us down the right paths, and, and keep all hurt, harm, and danger from us as we move forward to your everlasting kingdom. But we are dying each and every day, dying a little bit more, getting closer and closer to the kingdom of God. Each and every morning when we wake up, we're getting closer. We're getting closer. It doesn't matter if you're a newborn baby or if you're 90 years old, you're getting closer to the kingdom of heaven and that should be something to challenge. But we should die laughing, right? Knowing that I am anticipating the day to be with my heavenly father. So we're watch over, bless us and keep us in the there is someone who doesn't know Jesus Christ and they're part of their sins. This is an opportunity just to confess with their mouth that, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I know you're listening. I know you're paying attention, right? You're not too busy. Your, your arms are not too short to reach down and help me or to your ears are not uh, too small that you won't hear me cry out to you. So bless us and keep us on this day, Lord, and bring all these who are calling upon your precious name today into your fold. Bless us and keep us on this day. And it is in the matchless name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.